The following program is brought to you by Marshfield Community Television. Um, I'll be talking about the Civilian Cons Conservation Corps, otherwise known as Roosevelt's Tree Army, and I'll be talking a little bit about the general concept of the CCCs, but specifically focusing on Camp 657, which existed at uh, Summit Lake and then Elko in northern Langley County. When Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated in March 4, 4, 1933, the country was in the midst of the Depression, and he promised a new deal for America. He instituted a number of, of programs, and one of his more successful ones was the Civilian Conservation Corps, or the CCC. He was inaugurated on March 4th, and by March 21st, he announced his plan for the CCCs. Uh, very shortly afterwards, March 23rd, uh, Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins presented the plan to Congress with an emphasis on reforestation, and the program was approved. It wasn't too long after that, um, about a month or two months afterwards, that Camp 657 was set up in Summit Lake. Uh, some of the inspiration for setting up the CCCs the obvious one was that there was great unemployment in the country, but also Franklin Roosevelt believed in the benefits of nature and the outdoors, and he wanted to do something to um, enhance the availability of, the, of improved nature and the outdoors and to make it more accessible. So the goals were reforestation and soil conservation. Uh, this was inspired by progressive area, era conservationists who uh, advocated for conservation, uh, and especially since a, a lot of northern Wisconsin had been clear-cut by the lumber industry, this was considered very important. Roosevelt also believed that by establishing parks and recreation areas, he would provide access to the outdoors um, through hiking trails, campgrounds, and other ways to get people out to enjoy the outdoors. Uh, the CCC was under several departments, cabinet departments. The major one was the Department of Labor, which coordinated enrollee recruitment. The Department of War ran daily operations of the camps, and they were run on a military style, uh, and the people in charge were military officers. The Department of Agriculture and the Department of the Interior also played major roles. Uh, agriculture supervised conservation projects, and interior uh, supervised parks projects. CCC camps were spread out throughout the country. This map shows the, the distribution of camps after six months. By the time the program closed in 1942, more than 4,000 camps had been established. It was placing camps in the West was fairly easy because Federal land was abundant, but in the Midwest and in the East, they had to negotiate purchases for land to be able to set up the program. So the program itself included provisions and funding for land acquisition. Uh, the number of camps fluctuated during the entire life of the CCC. In the upper graph, you see the distribution or the numbers of camps with, uh, during different years. 1935 was the peak year with about 3,000 camps nationwide. And uh, Camp 657 existed pretty well throughout the whole lifespan of the program from 1933 to 1941. Uh, the, uh, the camps existed until 1941 or 42 when the U.S. entered World War II. The bottom slide shows different activities of the various camps. The upper line shows the, um, the uh, activity that was devoted to reforestation. 
and this was true throughout the U.S., that camps were uh, primarily uh, dedicated to reforestation. It was definitely true for Camp 657. This was by far their major thrust of their activities. And a typical uh, the life of a CCC enrollee, they were paid $30 a month, 25 of which was sent home. They worked a 40-hour week, and for many of them, they received better medical care, some <coughs> job training, uh, food than they did at home. A lot of these people came from impoverished families. Um, most of them were high school aged, uh, late teens, early 20s. That's when the program started. It was later expanded to um, and, um, enroll people around 25. And then a lot of World War II veterans uh, were also enrolled. And they were eligible for a, I'm sorry, World War I veterans, yeah. Um, they were eligible to serve for a six month term and that was renewable for up to two years. Uh, some of them found employment earlier than that. <coughs> and a typical day in the life of, a, of an enrollee was to get up at 6 a.m. This was a sort of military style reveille at uh, 6 a.m. This says at Camp uh, 657. Then there was a little period of calisthenics. There was breakfast and barracks cleanup. And then off to work in the fields. And uh, this is not this camp. This is from a file photo. But this is Camp 657. They're off to work. Often they were doing field work. And lunch was served at noon, often in the field. Back at the camp by 4 PM. Then there was um, cleanup, lowering the flag at 5, and then supper. And then in the evening, they had classes, and they had games and a rec room, and then it was lights out by 10 PM. So very sort of disciplined, military style setup. And uh, here are the recruits at Summit Lake, June 20th, when the camp opened, June 20th, 1933. They were living in tents at the time. And during the summer of 1933, while they were working, more permanent barracks were being established just down the road at Elko. And it was, this was a sort of typical setup. I think there were six barracks. And Elko um, was the district headquarters for a number of camps in the area. And then in, uh, November, on November 27th, 1933, the company uh, moved into their new barracks. They moved out of their tents, having already endured a number of sub-freezing nights in their tents. Uh, and they marched in military formation. I think it was a, probably around four miles or so from their tents into their more permanent barracks. Uh, this is some, if you tour the museum on uh, Saturday, the Antigo Museum, we have some of this material on display. This was the manual that um, was given to all enroll enrollees. There were some things about what they were expected to do as far as work goes, recreation and classes, and then going to town. They, they really were um, big on telling these people how to behave when they went to town. They went to dances, they went to social events, and, uh, and they were told uh, the rules of the game, basically. Here are just some views of life in Camp uh, 657. The, the camp infirmary, the kitchen. The kitchen, a lot of people, a lot of enrollees actually received some training that they would later use in finding jobs. And uh, mail call. And the machine shop. Um, down the bottom is a blacksmith shop, and this fellow here, we'll mention him a little bit later on, is Ed Drab, who received some training in the blacksmith shop. And this is a uh, certificate that somebody received for having completed a uh, landscaping uh, course. And 
I gave a presentation to a group of people once about the CCCs and uh, in the audience a woman just suddenly jumped up out of her chair and said, where did you get that? That's my father's certificate. She didn't even know what had happened to it, but it had been donated to the museum. And, uh, and there it is. She, she was quite happy to just get a copy of it. She left the original with the museum. Here is the mess hall in December 1933 when prohibition was repealed at the, at the table, there was one bottle of beer for each enrollee. And there are no questions asked about age. They just all got their bottle of beer to celebrate the repeal of prohibition. <laughs> that was a story I heard from that fellow Ed Drab that you saw earlier in the, um, in the blacksmith shop. Just a view of the uh, recreation hall, the recreation room. and the reading room where they also had classes. Um, about 90% of the enrollees nationwide were enrolled in some kind of classes and forestry was the second most popular class for people to enroll in. The first most popular one was first aid but that was compulsory. Everybody had to take the first aid course and forestry was the second choice. <laughs> and. Uh, Many of the young men, as a result of these classes, became very uh, conscious of the environment, of needs for conservation. Uh, they, they had no idea of any grand concepts of things, but they learned it at the CCCs. Here is a uh, work crew out in the field. They're, they're doing some stream and pond reclamation. For some people who are familiar with Langlade County, Camp Susan uh, was developed as a 4-H camp. It's still being used today. And it was developed as a CCC project. It's one of the few actually recreational projects that this camp, Camp 657, was engaged in. And the truck in the field, you can see they had their own license plates. I don't know how well that shows up, but it, there's somebody in Elko who, um, until recently, I, I think he's passed away recently, had a car and his license plate that he chose, uh, his vanity plate, was CCC 657. So the, the experience of working in the CCC 80 years ago was a lasting one, uh, one that he wanted to remember. Uh, on his license plate. Here is Ed Drab, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, in his mid-90s, when he came to the museum, he was still sharp, uh, and he donated a lot of photos and stories about the CCC. And he told me his, his first day on the job, he was a, in his early 20s, I think, very cocky, showed up in camp, and the um, the officer in charge asked him to climb a tower, uh, a forest uh, tower. And uh, he clambered up there, got about halfway up, he said, and then he looked down. <laughs> and he absolutely froze. He just couldn't move there. And the officer had to climb up there and take him by the hand and walk him down. And he said it was the most embarrassing thing in his life. And it, uh, in spite of that, the CCCs was the part of his life that he remembers the best that he's most proud of. It was a very uh, worthwhile experience for him. The, uh, his sister, uh, before he went off to camp, knit him this sweater, it says US CCC 657, and she made him this pillow cover, pillow sham, that he took to camp with him, and it says, uh, when we finish our part, a new day will dawn. And in the middle is, like in here, is E.D., Ed Drab. And then here on these things are President, FDR, uh, and this embroidery with the uh, trees and uh, this tent down here uh, is something that he used on his 
cot pillow uh, with pride. And it's one of these things that's fairly typical. These people would bring something from home, and uh, he wasn't laughed at the, uh, by the other enrollees. It was, it was uh, just a remembrance from home. And, uh, and as I say, in his mid-90s, when he came into the museum with this box of photos and stories and these two items, uh, it was, it, we were really proud to uh, be the recipient. He passed away not all that long ago at the age of 101. And a couple of years later, his sister, the woman who made these two things, also at the age of 101, also passed away. So just a little bit of statistics. The camp, there was a newsletter in the first four years of existence. This is where we have numbers for. There were 83 miles of truck trails, 12 miles of fire breaks, 23 miles of vehicular bridges, 235 miles of telephone lines, lookout towers, toolboxes set out in the field for firefighting. They built 23 buildings, including three garages. There were 1,379 acres of trees planted and 485 acres prepared for forest stand improvements. Three acres were prepared for game food and, covering, and cover planting three acres of public campgrounds, See, that was a really small amount, and game refuge fencing, lakes and streams and pond development, stocking of fish in the local ponds. So this, from a camp newsletter, after four years of existence, this is what the camp had accomplished. They had a base in Antigo, this was at, in the fairgrounds, a garage there, And in, in addition to all this work and field work, there were recreational activities. And sports was a major program. Boxing required the least space, least amount of equipment. And so boxing was a very popular activity. And there were tournaments. And they, they uh, entered tournaments uh, with locals and against uh, other CCC camps. But they also had a uh, basketball team. And down below, you see a baseball team and a basketball team. And uh, again, they played at the local, they played against the local high school, and they went on uh, to other camps to compete. And then they had a football team, and they called themselves the Packers, this <laughs> Camp 657. And they sent a letter to the Green Bay Packers uh, and they said, do you have any old equipment we could use? Because we're a CCC camp and we call ourselves the Packers. And several months later, this big box of stuff arrived in camp. This was reported in the newspaper. The Green Bay Packers had sent them some of their old discarded uniforms. And so it was much too big. The uniforms were much too big for any of these guys. They were mostly high school kids. But uh, they wore them proudly. And according to this newspaper article, there were big uh, arguments in camp as to who got to wear Curly Lambeau's uniform. <laughs> and uh, one guy made the claim that uh, since he had uh, actually seen the real Green Bay Packers play, he deserved to wear Curly Lambeau's uniform. But that didn't carry any weight. And I don't know who got to wear it, but uh, the, the, they were quite proud of this collection of uh, big uniforms that they wore. And other recreational activities, including going skating on the lake in Elko with, uh, in this, here you see some local women and some enrollees just fooling around on the lake. They did form a, um, a band that, uh, that played, and they would go to the Elko train depot either to uh, greet new enrollees or when somebody got a job and they were leaving the camp, they would uh, send, uh, send them off with a concert on, at the depot. I should also mention that the uh, enrollees' interactions with the local people was very good, partly because of the training they received. And they were, most of what, they were, a lot of them were high school kids that had come from farms and in Elko. It was a rural community and they were well accepted. Uh, and there was 
good rapport between the local people and the, uh, and the enrollees. And um, they went to local dances. Again, I don't know how many people know what used to be the Muskie Inn, big hotel in Elko, and another place in Summit Lake called the High Point Inn. And the High Point Inn, although it recently burned down, was a place they still went to for reunions uh, well into the 1980s. And I just like this picture, but all sorts of people, uh, kids of all sizes were in the CCCs. They published their own newsletter. Uh, originally, it was just a memory graph sheet called the Wood Chopper. And then it, it became a little bit more elegant newsprint uh, thing called the Elko Eagle. And here that the Elko Eagle was won second prize, second place in a national contest of CCC newspapers. Uh, a lot of camps had their own newspapers. A lot of them had ads from the local town businesses. Uh, and mostly it was camp news, but sometimes it was local news of the village nearby. And then in the early 1940s, the CCC camps began to close in great numbers. Uh, Camp 657 was still going in 1941, but then it closed. The last camp uh, ran until 1942. The United States had entered the war, and money and manpower were required for the war effort. Even before the final camps were closed, in the last few years, it was apparent that the United States w was very likely to enter the war. And a lot of these camps drifted over into kind of military training. They were building things that would eventually be used as uh, target ranges and barracks and things like that for, for military purposes. But that was just in the last couple of years of their existence. And um, altogether, nationwide, uh, the CCCs employed over 3 million men. They planted a lot of trees. and. Uh, constructed reservoirs. Uh, they developed a number of um, state parks in Wisconsin, Wyalusing, and, um, and Devil's Lake State Park are CCC projects. Um, and, uh, and a lot of this stuff really got the uh, general population uh, interested and concerned about environment protection. Uh, the, uh, the enrollees themselves and then the, uh, the townsfolks that they interacted with all became uh, conscious of, of all these things. And then the CCCs in Wisconsin employed 92,000 men in total, 75,000 of which came from Wisconsin. The amount of money that went out to families was about 16 and a half million. Ed Drab, who you saw before, said that the money he sent home saved the family farm. And I think this was true of a lot of people, that, uh, that 25 bucks a month really was important. And then just a number of lists of things that they did in Wisconsin. And after the CCCs, there was still this legacy going on. Uh, there was still this concern. During the war, there were POW camps in the US and in Wisconsin who put Germans to work. And some of them were to work into planting of trees. Uh, there were a number of, of uh, other programs that were created along the lines of the CCC. And then there was this Wisconsin Conservation Corps, which was formed in 1983 that was inspired by the CCC that was uh, whose goal it was to make uh, reforestation, land conservation, and establish uh, parks and recreational areas. And the two main re changes from the uh, in the WCC over the CCCs were that recruits lived at home rather than in barracks, and they would just show up for work. And the other thing is that women recruits were accepted too. This is something that Eleanor Roosevelt had uh, long fought for, to make women's CCC camps, but she never got her way. But finally, in this uh, 
uh, in this WCC program, women were accepted. Uh, what happened to the CCC barracks at, uh, in Elko is that uh, one of, uh, some of them, a couple of them were used after the war as a boat factory. Um, the boat factory existed in Antigo. They moved to Elko and they made wooden rowboats. And some barracks were used as uh, cottages. Here's one at Bass Lake that was uh, picked up and moved off. Somebody bought it and moved it to Bass Lake and um, had uh, used it as a cottage. And then if you go to Otter Lake now, just on the outskirts of, uh, of um, Elko, there is a plaque there commemorating the uh, site where the CCCs did uh, have their camp. And then a lot of the pictures that we have are available on a couple of websites. And if you come to the museum, I can, I can show you this. I have some cards too, but one is Recollection Wisconsin. We put all our pictures on there, and then we put together a feature story. And somewhere on the website, there is this search box. And if you type in CCC Camp 657, you'll find our whole collection of uh, CCC photos and documents, newspaper, newsletters, and things like that. And um, it's all available for viewing at a leisurely pace. And then there's this other site, a new site. It's called Wisconsin 101, Our History and Objects. And what they want to do in Wisconsin 101, WI 101 is what it is, is uh, take some object that represents some story in Wisconsin's history, describe the object, and then give the whole story related to it. And if you look at, at their home page, and then you see on the map, there's one thing there that says on the map. Um, if, you, if you click on the map, which is around Nicolay National Forest, but it's around Elko where the camp was, then up, up pops this pillow sham that I mentioned about Ed Drab, the, his sister made for him. And then you click on that, and it gives you a whole story, a uh, summary of the CCCs and uh, their importance in Wisconsin's uh, history. Those are the two sources if you want to look at more information. I can show you how to get to those sites later on, or if you come to the museum on uh, Saturday morning. Uh, the Wisconsin 101 and the Recollection Wisconsin site. And uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Thanks.